have nothing left to say How to get up, walk away Knowing the hold, knowing the fall my name is Rod Graham, and this is my YouTube channel, Conversations and Perspectives. And on this episode, I have Dr. Michael Wood. And actually, is it Michael? It's Michael A. Wood. I, it is whatever you want to call me, as long as I know who you're talking to. <laughs> but it is an A in there, and it's Junior there as well. Yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm here. I'm here with and here after you know uh, it's Rod and Mike, but I want to make sure. And, and give you your due uh, as uh, Dr. Michael Wood. And uh, I'll say a little bit about his background, just a little, and then I'll, I'll let him uh, tell his backstory as much as he li he's like, he'd like to. And then what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about his writing, his understanding of policing, uh, and we'll, we'll interweave as much as we can some uh, current events, but this is gonna be a pretty broad-based discussion. I'm excited about it, so this should be fun. So, so let me give a brief bio. Dr. Michael Wood served, previously served 11 years as an officer, narcotics detective, and sergeant in the Baltimore Police Department. Um, he's recently completed his PhD. If you go to Amazon, I, he seems to me to be a pretty prolific writer. So if you go to Amazon, you'll see he's got this series of books, The Business of Policing, I think, and he sent me uh, two of them. And um, I browsed as much as I could in the time I had. Um, very deep thinker. He's appeared on Joe Rogan, which I think is where I saw him first uh, during my Joe Rogan phase. And uh, Jimmy Dore, and on several, several uh, local news stations. So he's got a YouTube channel that I'll put in the show notes so you can go and look at what he has done. Okay, so um, Mike, what's up, man? Tell us the backstory. Oh, I know. We always like to get into the backstory, but I feel like it's actually incredibly uneventful. Um, and I, I understand it informs things. I get it. But I grew up in the 90s, um, 41 now. And in where I grew up, it was mixed neighborhoods, apartments and townhouses, completely mixed culturally and uh, racially. It, it was in one of those neighborhoods that where it's like everybody gets along a bunch of neighborhood kids running around. It was low income. Maybe there was a few uh, like lower middle class there. It could have been possible. And I just, I grew up watching TV, being a latchkey kid. I watched Cops and I watched Knight Rider and I got influenced by uh, the pathway out of poverty being something like the military and the police department. So eventually I always wanted to be a cop. So I went on and I went ahead and did that by going through the Marine Corps to kill the years between 17 and 21 where you, you got to wait to be a police officer. So I went into the Marine Corps, did four years there in infantry and in a fleet anti-terrorism security team, uh, which is like a SWAT for the Marine Corps for the military as a whole. And then I went to the Baltimore Police Department. You got a process. Spent 11 years there, mostly in the hood of the wire, as you would think of it. I spent most of my time in East and West Baltimore and uh, eventually became a narcotics cop. I made nearly 400 arrests, um, rose to the ranks, uh, become a shift commander. As a shift commander, I led about 45, 50 people, uh, handling shootings, murders, kidnappings, anything you can think of in, in uh, what is arguably uh, per capita, pound for pound, the most violent city historically in America. And then as I saw the, like, I, I, mean, I think a lot of cops want to be good. And, and I had the same intent, I wanted to be good. But what I really saw was not an issue with intent. I saw a lot of issues with just pure management. The, if you want people to do things, you have to incentivize and disincentivize them against those actions. You can't come around with you know, a punitive stick and just beat everybody into submission. It doesn't work that way no matter what you're trying to do. So I saw all these managerial issues and then really dedicated my education to trying to pursue what these managerial issues is. What was wrong with policing from an organizational standpoint? I was seeing a lot of organizational issues, not actually issues on the street per se. Um, after Freddie Gray was killed in Baltimore, uh, my, my main objection and where I kind of had that, that E status celebrityness 
was that I just went on Twitter, Twitter and did a rant once because I watched the Baltimore Police Department, officers I knew, the spokesmen and stuff like that, act like there was nothing wrong with what happened in the death of Freddie Gray. And I really thought that was preposterous. There's, there's no way under any professional account of standards that you can take a human being, a citizen of America, into your custody, they die, and you're like, oh, you know, things happen. <laughs> things don't happen in that situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I just started just rambling and, and spewing out all the things that we kind of do, we all know we do, but we don't say aloud in public. And I said, come on, if you guys are gonna lie about this, let's just be really open about our profession because we need uh, the light of day to really begin to make any changes that matter. And uh, a lot of people gravitated towards that. I became very disenfranchised with that process of celebrityness in Hollywood and all as I really saw it for just money making uh, nonsense with completely unprincipled people the entire path who really just wanted to use me as entertainment for violence porn and uh, to try and further their own power. And I really wasn't interested in that. So wait, I wait. continued so the I, interviews. Hold on, hold on. I didn't expect that. How did that, flush that out a little bit. What do you mean like people were, were trying? Because I immediately would have expected, so obviously education is not like policing, but if I was a whistleblower, which I am assuming in a way that you were, um, People would be like, "Ooh, tell me what's going on," because a lot of people hate what's going on university now. So if I came out and said, "Oh, there's this, there's that, they're biased," da da da, then people would gravitate to that and want to find out. But you're saying something different. Like, how would they? What is this violence porn you're talking about? Yeah, people want to hear my stories because I live the life of the wire. <laughs> they, they, you know, they kind of like see me like, "Oh, like there's McNulty," you know, like let's let's talk about what it was like. <laughs> and, and, and so they, they want to hear those yeah, stories. They want to. Yeah. It's kind of like how people sit there and watch serial killer shows all day long on Netflix, and they don't watch any. You know, they don't spend a time picking up something and actually learning. It's, it's the same kind of thing. They just wanted the entertainment value of my car chase stories and how grimy cops can be, how grimy the streets can be, versus what we had to do to actually solve these problems. They were. They were. Let's put it. Let's just say. As a, as a way to sum it up, they were more interested in talking about how Freddie Gray gets killed than preventing Freddie Gray from getting killed. And I was only trying to have the conversation about how Freddie Gray got killed in order to lead to the discussion of how to prevent that. And I didn't find much interest in, in the prevention. That's interesting. That's interesting. Uh, I get it. I get it. Um, I just didn't realize that that's what was happening behind the scenes. Yeah, whether you're talking about Hollywood or you're talking about the streets of the actual movement of Black Lives Matter, uh, I didn't find genuine interest absolutely anywhere. Um, I mean, I didn't say it in the story, but I traveled the entire country. My Google map looks pretty awesome. I was everywhere, all the major cities, meeting with people in the streets, trying to discuss this. I used that platform I had, like everybody tells you to do, and get out there and talk to people. And, and man, I, I, I found zero interest in the streets of actually making a change within the movement of doing things that actually would help Freddie Gray and people in that situation. And I felt zero interest in Hollywood of actually addressing those interests, zero interest in mainstream media in discussing those things. I'm usually on something, a big network only once because I'll, I'll demonstrate how the host is a moron and pretty much uh, is spewing you nonsense. And then they stop having me on because they're more interested in their egos than they are about solving anything. That's that's really something. It's almost like virtue signaling, in a way. Yeah, you know? I've I've Where begun to despise the victim Olympics a bit because I saw a bunch of people <laughs> claiming about fighting about who was the greater victim, versus uh, focusing on uh, making sure people weren't victims. Yeah. Wow, that's really something, man. That's really something. Um, all right. So um, you want to say so, but that's not the end of the story. You 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 got out of that. <laughs> you went through a PhD program. And the purpose of that was so that you would learn more about how to deal with these root causes? Yeah, I mean, I, I, for, I wanted to really just investigate truly and honestly what was happening. One of the things, I mean, it was, it was hilarious. I, I, I was fortunate to have a couple of good coworkers around me when I was a supervisor in the Eastern District. And we were very interested naively as just trying to be increasing our professional standards. And so we would do research and we would look into different things out there and uh, little things you would see on the regular, like 
the very, if you go watch The Wire right now, the very same corners uh, that they were talking about and they're showing are the exact same corners today that are doing, having the same problems. This goes back to the 60s, the same corners. And what are the police doing? We went back and found their, their action plans and their strategies, and they were literally doing the same things over and over and over again. And the exact same thing is happening right now. Even when you have the movement arguing for stuff and, and arguing for police reform, they end up making the exact same arguments that just result in more policing and more cracking down and going after people in these corners, absolutely no change towards actually just doing something different. I mean, from a scientific perspective, it was like, just do something different. You can't keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting a, a different result. Uh, how we incentivize and disincentivize the actions that we wanted seemed to be very misaligned. There was issues with you know, racist outcomes, and I didn't see racist intent from my officers. So what was happening here? And then I dig and you see the systemic issues that are kind of going through in the background that, that you're not recognizing and people aren't really paying attention to. So I kept seeing these things over and over and over and wanted to understand how to fix it. And eventually there was technology issues I come across and you come across stories like, like this, take, this is a dumb sidetrack for a second, but like officers get killed and that's a terrible thing. And as a profession, you should want to stop officers from getting killed. So here, here's an issue where maybe it's racist, maybe it's not, but it has some weird outcomes that are uh, racially biased. Black officers in Baltimore, I've known three of them that have gotten killed in friendly fire situations. And investigating these things, you find procedural issues that are a problem, but then you end up finding black undercover officers getting killed because of some of the biases that put in there. So there's obviously things that we should be doing to remedy this situation. It's literally our cops that we care about and nothing gets done about that. There's a- uh, Wait, 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 so, so before you go, mm -hmm. so the black undercover cops were being mm -hmm. killed because other cops thought that they were um, actual people in the investigation and they shot them? Yeah, I mean, okay, so I mean, I'll backtrack a little bit and say that I'm not comfortable with um, with ever assuming anyone's intent, but um, I think no matter what, when you're in a city like Baltimore, if I come around the corner uh, with, a, with a, a handgun and then you come around the corner with a handgun, I, I think pe most people are gonna give natural pause to me. And, and there's a lot of reasons that, that make total sense. The idea of a white guy running around with a gun that's about to kill somebody in the middle of a drug deal in a violent city like Baltimore, that doesn't make much sense. Most likely this guy's a cop. Um, if it's a black guy, I mean, you're in a toss up. So who gives the, you know, most, most cops don't, don't uh, take the, 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 the downside of any 50-50 decisions. They go ahead and go with the one that protects their life. So you can understand why this occurs. But we should be having things that easily solve these type of problems, like having codes, ensuring that no plainclothes officers engage in active situations. Just little things like that before your implicit biases in certain areas either work themselves out or don't work themselves out. The idea that, some, that a black guy is more likely to kill you in Baltimore is just empirically true. So I can't expect people to drop that bias. Okay. All right. So I'm sorry, you, uh, I cut you off, but I wanted to, to, to make that yeah, sure. clear. So another example is we had car crashes and one of the reasons why one of our officers was killed in a car crash was because of the positioning of the computer, the way it sits in the middle of the car, she was knocked forward and the computer crushed her. And nothing was ever done to change any of those mounts and things in the police department. So you can see like there's not, it's not that this system was, was, was shitty against people in the streets. It's like shitty against anyone that's involved in it. It was just bad no matter which way I was looking at it. So I wanted to prove the management issues and it, just, it went far beyond uh, the, the kind of surface areas of management you, you would think that were there. What I ended up discovering was, was kind of basic. Like any company or professional organization, you need to, the better the company is going to be and succeed is the more closely it's aligned with its stakeholders and shareholders that it's serving. So, I mean, it makes obvious sense. If, if, if Nike wants to sell more shoes, it needs to make better looking shoes that serve its customers better. Uh, so policing needs to make better products that serve their customers better, in which case you need to shorten the distance between shareholder influence, your community and your neighborhood versus what you have now, which is a, is a far distance to this kind of 
a representative idea that politicians are in charge and, and the, the assumption is that they represent the people of the street and they, they really can't do that. They don't have incentives that take them long enough. They only have four to eight year goals of their own political ascension. That's, that's not tied into the long-term needs of a community. So sure, there are politicians that kind of buck that trend, but as a system, you're talking about people who don't actually really represent the community being in charge of, of a, a completely uh, unmanaged and unorganized system of violence that is, ends up just serving those people. So it's like it was a private company serving the mayors and serving the politicians' interests versus serving the community's interest. And there's a lot of easy ways to just align those things closer. But I will have to say that I didn't find interest on either side of that ball game in resolving those issues. Politicians don't want to give up power, and I don't think communities actually want to take responsibility. Interesting. Okay, so I'm going to say two things. I'm all over the place. You reel it in. <laughs> oh, totally cool. Totally cool. The, the audience may wonder when you say what I found and what I didn't find. Um, Dr. Wood here did a dissertation where he spoke with people in policing, the managers in policing. Yeah, the, actually the academic managers. So the interesting point there, just to set that up a little bit, mm -hmm. is I found this crazy data that there's all these organizational systems where you, you go into a company, for instance, and they want their employers to behave better. So they give them this ethical and moral training. And all throughout the scientific literature and, and business white papers, this, this training is actually effective. It, you, you incentivize people to be more moral or to align their values more closely to the company's values is, is essentially what you're saying. But they were, and I thought to myself, well, why aren't they doing this with police officers. And so I started to research it. And yeah, they were. <laughs> they were doing these things. And it totally didn't work. There, there's a lot of data coming out of England where they were studying this closely. And they were noting that the, uh, the people going in, people who wanted to be cops, were, had this certain moral standard. And then they went into the police academy where they had some of this training that was proven time and time again to increase morality of employees. And it still ended up failing. They would leave the police academy with a lower sense of morality than they did going into it. So what is unique about policing here yeah, what is that? That, that is separating us? So that's what I wanted to investigate. And to, to do that, I wanted to do a thematic analysis, which was an effort to read between the lines of the people who were in charge of academy command, uh, basic academy, so police academy where somebody goes in. They, they would be the commanders or the directors of these academies. Okay. And I wanted to get their input, because usually these are educators. They know that this stuff is supposed to work and to present them with why it doesn't and see what they were seeing out there and then read between the lines about what they were talking about. And what I found was something that I guess I knew, but I never really thought about. And that is that there is a huge disconnect in the definitions of what is ethical and moral behavior within the law and the policing system and the policing culture itself. Uh, the, the law essentially says that police act upon their own individual morality, and about half the cops believe that. And then the people believe that cops should, believe, should act with, their, with the sense of the, the communal or the organizational sense of ethics, which means to do what the community wants you to do, the community's expectation of morality, not your own individual expect, uh, expectation of morality. And a lot of policies and procedures use, flip the, the term ethics like uh, that individual ethics and communal ethics or organizational ethics are the same thing and they're, they're, they couldn't be more opposed than they are. They're complete opposite pools. And, and so as long as there's like this entire confusion about what is moral behavior, because cops are thinking, oh, well, to do moral behavior, I need to do what is right. That's what the law says. The law says it's up to, to the, the typical officer, essentially, which means the, the, the average officer and, and what they would think is right. And that's the standard. So on an individual level, did you feel that your life or the threat of somebody else's life were in was in danger? And would the typical officer agree with that that was in a reasonable thought? That's, that's, that's the standard of what is ethical in an action for a police officer. 
But the community, as you can see, in, in even a lot of protests, as much as I believe they're nonsense, that these, they're, they're saying that they want the cops to do what they want them to do, not what the cop wants to do. And I would very much agree with that logic. And part of the change that I think we need in policing is to move towards a very strict communal ethics standard. But I, I think the problem from the cops is, is obviously they don't want to give up the power of being able to be judge, jury, and executioner. And then the citizenry doesn't want to expect, accept the responsibility. For instance, if Derek Chauvin uh, killing George Floyd, or I mean, uh, I shouldn't even use that term yet, uh, and the death of George Floyd. Uh, I'm sorry, I got my phone ringing, and that's super rude. But um, I should have planned better to not have my phone ring. That's funny. Uh, so I'll just finish that real quick. I just want to stop that thing from going Roger, 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 Roger. Um, so the... Uh, where was I? Bring me back on track. Uh, ethical behavior. The police don't want to. Um, okay, so they have the community. That means with Derek Chauvin and George Floyd. Like, so if okay. Derek Chauvin is trained to use that position and stand there and somebody dies, if the outcome is negative, in a communal uh, sense, you are being, you're holding to the process. And typically what the community finds is that when the outcome doesn't go the way they think it should go, then, they, then they're outraged. But that, that, that would have to, there requires a realigning of the communal thinking and thinking in general to focus on the process, not the outcome. I'm very process oriented instead of outcome oriented because the outcome is, is largely unpredictable. You just want to be doing the best thing as a process and sometimes the outcome goes wrong. But when the outcome would go wrong in a situation like that, that means there's no punishment you can have for the officer. I mean, the officer has to go about their day like nothing happened. If they, if they abide by the rules that you establish. And part of the problem is the vast majority of police killings do abide by the laws that have been established by the people. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I need some, I want a concrete, so this is interesting to me, this, this disconnect between community morality and uh, the individual policeman's morality. Right. Uh, I, I think I understand, but I, I would want like a specific example. Like, what is it that the, that, that the community would want the police to do and that they think is right? Because we're talking about values here, I guess, more than law, maybe. So, so what do they think is right in a situation? Whereas a policeman would think, oh, no, that's not right. This is what is right. Like, what, what's an example of that? Yeah, I, I don't think either one of them would think the situation is wrong. So what I mean here is let's take something like where people argue for set standards in the escalation of force. So you hear people complain and say, why didn't they use the baton? Why didn't they use the pepper spray? Or they're argue for a certain technique or something like that. So this is what I'm talking about. There will be a policy of, the, of an escalation of force. So an officer arrives at a scene, a guy is, has his hands in his pockets, he's being what is called passive uh, resistant, which means he's not doing anything to you, but he's not following orders. In this case, the standard around the country is that you can give verbal commands and if the person doesn't follow verbal commands then you would escalate to something like pepper spray if pepper spray doesn't work you escalate to a baton you escalate to a taser you escalate then to, then to deadly force or something like that if it happens and, and so what happens here is say these things occur and the person arrives the officer arrives the person has their hands in their pockets they're not complying uh, the officer pepper sprays, they're still keeping their hands in their pockets and they're not complying. So the officer takes out a taser and he shoots the person with the taser. The person dies. Then the community is outraged, but the officer literally followed what he did. And he, he, he may have only used that taser. For instance, I, don't, I never use a taser or a baton. I didn't like either one of them. I don't like the idea of less lethal weapons. If I'm going lethal, I'm going lethal. I don't like that ambiguity in the middle, but that's my personal opinion. As a servant, I'm gonna do what you tell me to do. If you had ordered me to follow those things, I would have followed them, but I would have entirely disagreed with doing those things. I dropped my baton because I didn't think it looked right under any circumstances for me to be beating the shit out of somebody with a stick as a public servant, <laughs> I dropped my baton. It didn't make sense. I didn't like using tasers because tasers are less lethal. They are not anywhere remotely near non-lethal. They're, they're usually very ineffective and they can kill the person that you're using them on. And if I wanna kill somebody, I'm, I'm gonna do it 
when I know that person needs to be killed, not in this middle weird stage. But you set up those, those rules, and if you set up those rules and I use the taser and the person died, you can't be blaming me. Hmm. You know, okay, I've watched a lot of, and I've had a few folks on to talk about uh, policing, just not in an in-depth way. Um, it's, it's sort of um, interpersonal dynamics, okay, how to escalate and whatnot. But this is really interesting because it is the case that me as someone who knows very little about what happens in day-to-day -day policing, I would think that the use of a taser because someone is not complying is wrong. I don't care about the law. Like you're saying, you know, okay, the, the, the police officer is doing what he's supposed to do. But to me, it's like, okay, this is bad. This, this is over-aggressiveness. This is, uh, and it's, in my mind, directed towards black folk. That police would not have done that if that was an elderly Asian woman. This, this, this type of thinking I have in my head. And I see it as immoral. I really do. Um, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's just, I, I never... I'm sure you probably know, but black folk talk about this overaggressiveness all the time in black spaces. But we don't use this this idea that, that you are, and that's something I think people need to know that look, okay, the police officer is probably doing what he's supposed to do. And so instead of getting at that individual police officer saying, Hey, this person is a is a is, you know, racist or something, we have to start thinking about the rules that are in place. Yeah, is it systemic racism or not? Because systemic racism is systemic issues. It's not individual issues. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. I, I've always thought, I'm not sure. I don't think that police officers are, are uh, more likely to be racist than, uh, you, you may have a different view, but more likely to be racist than any other sample of the population. I would argue they'd be, they'd be less more likely. likely. To, say again? I would argue they'd be less likely. Less likely, interesting. Yeah. Of course, we see everybody at their worst. We know you're all shitheads. <laughs> okay. Well, well, what, but but the thing is, they're more aggressive, though. That's not true. Um, so, no. it, not at all. Um, for, for one instance, just just so you know, you might not know this, but in white spaces, uh, we talk about how over aggressive police are to white people. Just so you understand that. Okay. Um, the the data is very clear. The most disproportionate with police violence is absolutely white females. Um, Asian males would be second, and black males are 16 times less likely to be shot by a police officer than absolutely anyone else. So uh, the, the narrative that cops are more aggressive, actually it, it defies everything we know about human nature. Um, all crime is inter-familiarity. Uh, so you've heard this used against you, I'm sure when somebody will point out black on black crime. And it's like, yeah, all crimes interfamiliar. It's white on white, black on black, male on male, female on female. This is how things are. Whatever your inner circle is, is the people that do it. So uh, that's just not, it's, it's not uh, enlightening information you know, that, that that occurs. But the same thing is true of police. Black cops are vastly more aggressive towards black suspects and white cops are vastly more aggressive towards white suspects. Uh, you are more comfortable committing violence within your familiarity circle, not out of it. There, there's, there's zero reason, zero evidence to believe that police are the exception to that. It's so interesting. I would not have thought that at all. So, so the data part we can quibble about, because I've read I've read that, that uh, black males or black people in general are less likely to be shot and killed, but I've right. also read that, that maybe when it comes to the use of force, police are more likely to use like a taser or pepper spray against, against black people. Yeah, that might be, um, as we can talk about later and, and these measurements, I, I mm -hmm. think the data that, if, if, I think the only data we can use for anything is homicides and ex very extreme situations. I really, I really think the rest of the data is crap. Um, so where you're coming this in and, and where I would agree um, that I would make the case, but I, I'm only making the case to kind of argue it. I don't have the data su to support this. This is largely experience driven. So what happens is, is police respond to violence. And the black community, 
uh, like it or not, is, 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 as a whole, if you're going to group people by race, which let's set the standard now, I'm not a believer in, and I have no interest in, in doing so. But if that's the paradigm we're talking about, it, black neighborhoods are vastly more violent than, than everybody else, and police respond to violence. So what happens here is this very small minority within the black community is extremely violent. And, and the, that violence is towards that black community. So the police are sent in by the black community to go after this minority. And while they're going after this minority of people who are violent, they are being tasked with arresting people and, doing, and hunting down cases and enforcing laws. And one thing about people, they can only go after what they can see and our range is very short. So what happens is, is the regular majority of the black community in these neighborhoods, they end up being double victims. They live in fear from the violence and they have to worry about that. But then the communal response to the violence puts them in, in a, another victimization situation where they're vastly more likely to be arrested for something stupid, for a drug possession offense, uh, uh, for any, if, uh, literally anything, jaywalking, anything, because the police are getting paid to lock people up. And it's not like people are just running around, even in the worst neighborhood, it's not, it's not like you got gunshots ringing out all day long. So it's not like you can sit there and go after violence. There's actually not that much violence to go after. So they go after whatever they can see. And that ends up being a double victim to these communities. Now, those double victims that you're talking about, I, I think you're going to find, if we can measure that, you would find vast more uses of force on the whole and overcharging and criminalization all across the board for those double victims, absolutely. Hmm. That's interesting, that's really interesting. You also said something that I didn't think about until now. It's something that I may wanna explore later. But I've always had this view, and this is going back to race again. Now, now for the viewers who don't know, we had a few back and forths on uh, Twitter and my, my Twitter presence is different than this here. Uh, here I'm quite, you know, conciliatory. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not right. So, 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 so we've had some, some, some back and forth there, and so I, I have an idea about your views on race. So, um, I, so, I'll just use my views to, to kind of talk about this a little bit, and then you can kind of look at it differently. But I was all, I always had this idea that people are more likely to be violent towards a racial outgroup. So I'm using race, and, and it may not fit with how, how you understand it. Uh, more likely to be violent towards a racial outgroup because they're others. Like, like that's a kind of standard sociological way of thinking about it, which could be wrong. Because you're saying that people are more likely to be violent amongst people they know, which, which will be people who are, are of the same uh, culture or racial group. That's really interesting, Mike. I, I never really thought about that. Yeah, I'm, I gotta say it's inarguable that I'm correct on this one. I mean, the doubt okay. is 100%. Fair enough. Right. <laughs> okay. All right, now, you sent me some things to read, and uh, it's in the middle of the semester, but I did browse enough to get a good understanding, especially of your, um, your dissertation. So uh, you can go on Amazon, and you've got, how many of these volumes of the business of the police, business of policing do you have? Right, right now, there's only three, but eventually, there'll, there'll be a lot more. I have it laid out. I've just been extremely unmotivated. <laughs> is a lot man i mean you gotta run out i mean hey after three you should be unmotivated well i ha i have to i must i hate when people say i have to i must write uh the the whole concept of of realigning the shareholder values and bringing them to the community at some point in time i have to do that i, I can't i can't leave it out there okay all right well um in reading that i pulled two phrases you kind of already mm -hmm. talked I believe, uh, both of them, actually. Um, but I want to just say them, and then you can comment if you like. But I like them. You said in one of these uh, volumes, I can't remember, modern policing is like having the owners of Nordstrom determine what the customers at Wendy's will eat. And this is getting, I guess, to this idea of, uh, you know, Share, uh, communal values versus individual values, or is it something a little different? No, this is how disconnected we are from our shareholders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I was kind of getting that. I never thought right. of it. <laughs> so the community is our customer. And one re place I really butt up against cops is that when, when I'll say something like, um, 
Should a cop risk their life for a drug dealer? Yeah, yeah, that's our job, bro. We're, we're, we don't have the same civil rights as everybody else. Um, our job is to be servants and treat our life as less valuable than the community we're serving. Yeah, that's totally our job. And that's how much of a customer the community has to be to us. And we're not actually taking our, our, our alignments from that group of shareholders. We're taking our, our, our interests, our policies, our direction from an entirely different group of shareholders, and that's typically in major cities, going to be politicians with their own four to eight year goals. Okay. All right. I think, I think anyone who hears you say that would, 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 would totally agree with you as well. All right. You also said, which I already knew, but, but a lot of viewers don't. Crime stats are a measure of police action, not citizen action. Now flesh that out a little bit. Yeah, so I, I'm very happy that you knew this because I feel, I don't know, I think I was in like a master's program before I started to connect these dots and I had already been a cop for probably a decade. <laughs> and um, I started, people were talking about like crime this, crime that. They'd always say this on the news and, and, and everything else. And I would, I thought it was common knowledge, I guess, but that crime is just a police officer's report. So one thing I know for sure is that if I go to a scene where somebody called and their house was burglarized and I go into their house and I see that it was burglarized and then the person decides they don't want to fill out a report well, I don't write a report, which means there's no burglary. If their neighbor fills out the report and I fill out the report, then there's a burglary. Uh, so burglaries are measurements of how many times a police officer wrote a report on a burglary. And it's not even the, the first officer necessarily that wrote this. This is how the report ended up through the system in a notorious way that's infamous and notorious because it should be criminal. But Martin O'Malley in Baltimore, when he was mayor, he came in as mayor and to juke the stats, he went back into old reports and started finding reasons to uh, increase what they were. So take it from uh, a second degree assault to a first degree assault. Take it from um, an aggravated uh, assault by shooting for one victim to two victims so that it would look like there was two shootings and stuff like that. And he did that to the past record so that the crime numbers went really high for right before he took office. And then while he was in office, we, had, we did everything we can as a police department to downgrade all the things. So if a shooting, if two people were shot at, it would be one aggravated assault by shooting. So it would go down as one crime instead of two crimes. And so he, if you look at the books, he looks like he has this great crime reduction. At the same time, it's absolutely not true. Violence is going up and it's hard to hide the body. So you know what actually is happening by the one stat that matters and that we have to infer everything off of, and that's homicides. Okay. Um, I, I kind of knew this through, through the uh, sort of side door in that uh, I was interested in algorithms and predictability. Mm. And I realized that, okay, you know, they're, they're looking at what the police officer puts in the police report, but that may not have anything to do with actual behavior uh, on the streets. And so people are using these algorithms as if it's the truth and in, in some ways compounding problems because, okay, just because you have police reporting crimes January 2020 in this census block, okay, now you're going to put police officers in that same census block in January 2021 using the model. Mm -hmm. But that's just based upon what the police officer, that police officer are already there. Which right. could come past. So, I'll give you good ammo. You want good ammo for that? So for sure. One, one thing where you can bring kind of some opposing ideas together when we talk about oppression, there are a lot of stats where white males are extremely oppressed. Um, and now, we might not like to discuss that as a public, but that's the way it is. And one of the leading ones is in drug overdoses uh, that, you know, some people might call them suicide certain times. Sometimes I would call them poisonings by the most part, but they're drug overdoses right now. And it's vastly disproportional, the amount of white males 
who commit is who who die from drug overdoses than black males who die of drug overdoses but there's obviously a lot more black males getting arrested for drug possession than white males proportionally and so the death the only actual stat we have indicates that a lot more white people are using the drugs interesting okay yeah yeah no hey man i actually believe that we need to focus more on um on poverty in general, but also poverty in areas that are that are mm. dominant. Can we can we can we just go ahead and hit that real quick, Rod? Sure. Let's <laughs> so do one it. of the big things of my research uh, that I was really surprised to learn, some of it I knew, the number one cause of, of violence is environmental poisoning. It's actually lead poisoning. The, the data is unbelievable. Anyone can just type in lead poisoning, violent correlate, and it will blow your mind. The the how strong the correlation is between uh, your your um, let's see exposure to lead as a child versus your violence later on. I mean, it is it is spot on on the percentages and the in increases. So that is the number one cause. Currently, I mean, currently overall, obviously these things can move up and down because they're just orders. Uh, the second thing is inequality, and this is very important to do this because it is not poverty. Poverty is not remotely associated with an increase of violence or crime. It is, it is associated with a decrease in violence and crime. Uh, what happens is, is when we see it in front of us, when we see the other person having a lot more, the difference between the resources is where you have a crime and violence correlate. It's not at all remotely related to poverty. Um, there are examples, there are, there are tribes in Australia and Africa that almost have no money and have virtually zero violence and crime within them. It's, it's not remotely associated. The inequality is extremely important. And I would, I would propose that's why in America, we, we have this perspective of being a victim from the lower class in America, but yet the lower class in America is the world's elite. They are, the homeless here are way more privileged than significant, millions and millions and millions and millions of people on this planet. And we're also, but we also have that big inequality. So it like stands out to us more, even though our level of poverty, poverty being a relative thing, is not, not remotely comparable to the rest of the world. The third thing is, is local instabilities, which you see a lot of right now. So you talk about fatherless homes, bad programs, joblessness, things like that or the third thing, and the fourth thing is the police themselves, because the police are society's answer uh, of violence for violence. But just, sorry about that side note. I, I always want to clear up that poverty is just not correlated with violence or crime. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense to me, because um, it's, uh, it's kind of, uh, you know, it, it bothers me a little bit, because I, I know how it works, right? You, you get a, a exposed to lead and, and for whatever reason that, that prevents you from controlling your impulses as you get older and of course that's related with crime so on the one hand it's like man it's good that we know that but it also means what do you do with the person who the, the 10 year old kid you know has uh, absorbed or ingested lead you know it's kind of like a m minority report type thing um, biologically you know right and, and crazily even police victims of violence are, are, are way more likely to have been lead poisoned as well. So it, it's, it's, mo it's very much tied to victimhood and uh, being the perpetrator. Interesting, yeah, man. Yeah, that, that's really something. I had a master's student who, who just looked at surface level data. And, and so, yeah, that lead stuff is, and that's tied to poverty because that's in poor neighborhoods. Uh, sure, yeah. That old, uh, those uh, lead paint in the houses and stuff. So, and, okay, well, this is what I wanna do now. I wanna ask you, one last question about civilian-led policing. Just kind of wrap that up. And then I want to ask you about um, this uh, CRT stuff and how do you feel about it. I think um, that would be a good thing to talk about. So, all right. You've done all this uh, research and you've got the experience. By the way, man, I, I don't know what you, you want to do with your life going forward, but, but you're the exact kind of person who needs to be a public spokesperson for this, maybe you don't want to do that, but it, but the, the the fact that you've got that experience, which gives you some some credibility, and you've also gone and done the research, you can talk to many different populations, and they'll both respect you. So, um, I mean, I, I think 
I don't know what you want to do, but I mean, that seems like a really good avenue for you. So, so what is a uh, civilian-led policing? Because this is how you, want, you think we should reform policing. Yeah, and I really, I really thought, I, I, I really thought like you did about four or five years ago. Um, and I think okay. a lot changed when the movement got taken from the streets. When the movement at the beginning was still on the ground level with local communities, it was, it was I, I felt very much optimistic about having those discussions and I was going around doing a lot of these things and talking to everybody. But something changed. Um, I, I can't put my finger on what it is, but when it became a national discussion and a part of what I've learned a lot and a reason why I think civilian led is, is very important is that the local level, uh, as much as I wanted to fight for the national picture, I don't think these kind of changes can actually work and, and have an effective national discussion. These are very local issues grounded in, in local communities and the idea that something like race would tie them together, like black Detroit and black Jacksonville. <laughs> have something in common, I, I think is, is silly. Both of these places are going to want very different styles of policing. So what civilian-led policing is more of a framework. What I'm trying to do is present you with the framework that the science says would work. And a lot of our very strong science in the business world, as much as we don't like it because we're seeing a different angle of it, but the system that Exxon uses, where they have shareholders who are in invested in long term into their company, they have a board, they have uh, a CEO who runs the, the thing like a business, like an organization. They separate their, their, their operations to provide safety and provide watch to make sure one person's not screwing up another thing. Sometimes they separate operations. So when things are very critical, like one unit will handle a bit, another unit will handle a bit, another unit will handle a bit. And you have all these, these type of organizational management things that incentivize and disincentivize employees to work towards the common good of this company and they they reap the shareholder benefits that are very successful so the people their shareholders and stockholders have, get the benefits out of that company that they were looking to get out of that company and the people who are working there are also getting everything that they need working in synergy aligning their values back and forth now when we see the profits being made for Exxon we kind of look at the system poorly and I understand that but when we take these, these, these types of systems and we move them over to how a community and a police department interact, I think it's clear even for the layman to see that you would want to use that type of a system where the, the, the shareholders, you as a community member, are directly influential to what the board is doing and who the board works for. They don't, can't be working for a governor with four to six years. The main evidence for that is that we're talking about lead poisoning. Lead poisoning is a 20 year delay in the, in the, the effects from poisoning a children to poisoning an adult where the violence comes in. So what politician will ever have any interest in this long term 20 year goal of a community? It's just not gonna happen. So what we need to do is, look, is have the people who are long term in charge. And we go about that through tons of different ways. I know we can argue about who's on the board. But to do this, I, I promote establishing a board that is done by a lottery of people who have been in the community by a set group of standards. And we can argue about what those set standards are because it's not about my opinion on those, those standards. My opinion and what I'm promoting is about the framework. I build a table for you to put your ideas on. I can give you my opinion, but largely my opinion is just as shit as your opinion is. So we need to have something where we're working together, where I'm somebody like me is the operational person, but what you're wanting to get as a community is something that a shareholder uh, with equitable systems, because I have it equitably set up so that if you're like more likely to get arrested, then you're more likely to be on the board. If you're uh, get, receiving more police services, so if you're from a neighborhood that calls 911 more, then you would be more likely to be in the lottery system for being on this board. And that's how we create equity and balance. We create a police department that serves everybody because whoever is getting treated essentially uh, most intensely by the police department is the one that's also most likely going to be on the board and, and guiding the system as it goes forward. It's kind of like there's a system, maybe you know what it's called, I can't remember. There's just a saying, 
that you shouldn't make any rules unless you, or you don't know where you're gonna be in the rank structure of where it is. And right now we have the elites making the rules for the regular people. And I don't think that, it, it, it requires very complicated processes other than aligning those shareholders into the people who are actually talking and having discussions with somebody like me to, to decide what to do with the police department. Does that make sense? Yeah, so let me, let me push back a little bit. Mm -hmm. What if the community says, okay, um, you want our input? We want to abolish you. Sure. <laughs> no, <laughs> not sure now, because police... Be now, I'm going to argue with you. I'm going to explain to you about how every single city has a managed, who has even become remotely close to that idea is paying the repercussions and the people who will suffer the most as they do in Baltimore and everyone else are the people who are calling 911 the most and that's the grandmother who is scared in her house and is calling the police to come deal with the violence on her street. You're hurting the community, that's, that's some neoliberal bullshit because you're just gonna end up, uh, the rich people will hire private security, you don't need as much policing obviously out in the county, so uh, the people who are asking for the police and want the police are poor black neighborhoods, so you're literally doing that neoliberal shit where you're coming in here with your great idea uh, that you think is wonderful, but all you're gonna do is hurt the, the person that you think you're helping. Oh, I can't hear you, Rod. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on! All right, I can hear you, but I think I have to... Hold on, I gotta put a battery in this damn thing. Hold on, give me one second. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, brother. I was like, is this dude talking? All right, you there, Rod? Yes, sir. All Can right, you hear me? we're back on track. I'm sorry about that. So that's what happens with these long interviews. My batteries all die. Okay. All right. All right. Well, we're we're wrapping up. I try to keep it about. No, 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 no. I don't care about them. I'm just bullshit. So I'm okay. assuming that you you had some pushback on my uh, defunding the police as some neoliberal elite white person shit. <laughs> yes, I would not have articulated it that way, but yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, they would reap the um they reap what they sow right is if they say you know defund or abolish and then there's going to be some consequence people can get hurt in that environment in that in that locality yes but that's the problem so okay i get this idea in the abstract of civilian-led policing but civilians may not necessarily be the most informed so they come and they may say all right yeah, let's do this, let's do this, let's do that. And those are all bad ideas. Yeah, you know? yeah, sure. So the way I have yeah. it set up is that you, you would bring in the experts and you would have somebody like me there. Uh, we have to, everybody's going to want to do this. So you got to remember, there's going to be seven to nine people on this board. So other people are going to be like, what are you talking about when somebody comes up with something crazy? But okay. this is probably the biggest fear that we have. And wherever we see these kind of things implemented, these, these fears don't really come to any type of fruition. And again, it's about the process, it's not about the outcome. Will there be bad outcomes? Absolutely. You don't learn unless you have a bad, bad outcome. Whenever you, you were right about something, all you did was boost your own arrogance and you, you, know, you didn't learn a damn thing. You only learn when you mess up. So I'm hoping there'll be a lot of mess ups because that's how we're learning, we keep going forward. Right now, all we do is mess up, mess up, mess up, mess up, and don't try something new. I mean, I'm not saying if you try something new, it won't mess up from time to time. The point is to be on a scientific endeavor that's improving. Okay, well, this might be a nice uh, segue then because a lot of these ideas about um, radically changing policing are grounded in a critical perspective. And so over the past three or four years, maybe a little longer, maybe the past 10 years even, there has been this 
move towards thinking critically about society. And, and one variant of that is critical race theory, where they're always looking at how a policy is racist towards uh, black people mainly, but any persons of color, and how whiteness matters and white privilege is a part of society. Um, so that, that kind of critique would probably lend people to want to defund or abolish uh, policing. Now, what do you think about this whole critical race theory thing? Well, I, for one, I, I largely uh, disagree that anyone actually wants the police departments defunded. I think they say it as complete rhetoric because at the minute they have a chance, they actually just want the power of the police department to work for them. It's a power grab. Uh, they're not actually trying to. I mean, the first thing that anyone that says defund the police does when they get punched in the mouth is, oh, call the police. I, I'm just not call buying it. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I know these people firsthand. Uh, I'm not buying that there's actually a defund the police movement. It's a put me in charge of the police department movement. And I, I kind of agree with that, just not you. <laughs> this needs to be a community thing. Um, so my, my, okay. my basic view on racism and the idea, I would say the critical race theory is kind of like being anti-racism. Would you agree with that? Yeah, they, they, they go together. Right. Yeah. So I think to be anti-racist is just as racist as any other race. Racistness. Um, the the so when you have so what a, let, let's just let's just use the paradigm. I don't buy it at all. The idea that there's white privilege, of course, in certain spaces there's white privilege, in black spaces mm -hmm. there's black privilege, in certain spaces there's black privilege, in certain spaces there's Asian privilege. It's, it's such a nonsense concept, but okay. but the idea that uh, so a, a white supremacist would say uh, white people are the best, uh, least oppressed. Um, uh, the Asians are next, um, then it's, uh, you know, then, 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 uh, Mexicans or something, and then, uh, then, then, uh, Africans and then black Americans and then like people from the Middle East or something like that, whatever they're going to say. And then the people who are, are woke or, uh, critical race theory or any of these anti-racism, they say, no, we need to pay attention because look, the uh, people from the Middle East are really oppressed, and these the blacks, uh, de 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 uh, descendants of slaves, are are uh, oppressed, and and then it's the black men, and then it's the Mexican, and then it's the Asian, and then white people don't even subject at all. Just because you flip the, it's like saying person of co color versus colored person. I'm sorry, dude, you can't just flip the list from most oppressed to least oppressed and think you're doing something different. It's the, it's the exact same thing. To, to look at somebody and look at their race, look at their immutable characteristics and judge them as being lesser or worse is the exact same bigotry. Okay, okay. I, I, I have heard that argument before. <laughs> I, I don't think it's an argument. I mean, please, please demonstrate to me how classifying people by race and treating them differently isn't racism. <laughs> well, I, I guess, so this is what I, I tend to do, right? Um, people will say, will say that, you know, treating people differently based on race is racism. And so what I'll tell them is I'll say, okay, fine. I, I think in our everyday conversation, we want to go ahead and talk about it that way because we understand each other. However, if I was going to sit down and let's say analyze things, what I might do is I would say, okay, there's prejudice and discrimination, and then there's racism. Prejudice being, you know, your thoughts about a different group. So black people can be prejudiced towards white people, white people can be prejudiced, you know, everyone can be prejudiced. Then you've got the actions, which is discrimination. And it's also at an individual level and people can do it. I can own a business and I can only want to hire Mexican people or something, and a white person walks in the door, I don't want it. Okay. However, we've seen throughout history that what really creates all these problems that we've seen is when you have a group that has power, you know, dominating police forces, uh, um, uh, they're, they're the politicians, they're the business owners, they're commanding the military. You have one group that have that has this general idea that they are better than uh, uh, Roderick. Who, who's classifying into them into these groups? You mean who? You are. So I, you are. History. No, you are. 
no, no, no. That, that, that's history. I, so got, I, I got nothing in common with any any other person just because they're white. Literally zero. That's fine. I'm, I'm saying that. I'm saying that. So you don't in, get to do that to me. You don't get to group me with people that I disassociate with. I would say that if you don't. No, want because to you're say saying if I'm in charge not. of a police department that I'm part of that issue, and you're just wrong. No, what I'm saying is that in the past, this is what has happened. And this I, is what who is cares happened. about the past? It's important. Man, how, how so? How so? You're you're honest. you're already st you're saying the past, but you're not going back. And I bet you're not going to go back and talk about the past of the elite blacks who sold slaves off. I bet you're not going to go back to the Ottoman Empire when the brown power ruled the entire world. You're going to selectively pick a date that fits that would your be argument, racist. so go for it. That would be racism. Because in the abstract, the idea is that if one group dominates society and think that they're... What better... groups, bro? Hmm? What group? I'm if group America. Want, I'm group America. It. Fuck everybody else. So if you want to say that I am mm -hmm. I am a uh, American chauvinist and you can group me with all other Americans, I'm fine with that. But if you, you think you, hold, on, hold on, if you have the power, if you think you have the power to group me with anybody else, you're wrong. Right, but you're all of a sudden becoming irrational now. I'm trying to tell you that. Because of what we know in history, when those certain conditions are in place. Yo, history is written by the victor. We don't know. You're, you're just pretending to know that, which you don't know. Everyone knows this. You can look at South Africa. You can look at Germany. You can look at United States in 1950. It was a group that thought that, okay, we are deserving and these other groups are not. Every group so thinks that they're deserving no matter what the group is. Well, when those conditions are in place, well, that group that thinks right, every all the black people who sold black people into slavery went down mm -hmm. and hunted and caught them and put them on the free market for other people That's to right. buy 4.5 million of them going to Brazil and brown people. Those mm -hmm. people had some power. That's problematic. Yeah. If you would like to say that there is a condition that creates racism, I'm fine with it. What I'm telling you is that- But those people had the power. Don't you understand that? You are saying that white people are better than you. You are. No, what you're doing right now is instead of hearing my argument, you're coming with these preconceived notions. It's something quite different. You're just not catching it. What I'm saying is that, okay, white people in 1960 thought that Black people were not deserving of certain things. That's not that's nonsense. The group, the vast majority of white people thought otherwise. Oh, I don't that's think how so. the law got I passed. So. I mean, the evidence is very clear. Oh no 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 no! Uh, black folk and a small percentage of white people had to fight to change the morals. It doesn't matter. They ended up having to vote. Oh sure, you can change people's ideas. And then everybody so went along with it. So for you to say that they mm -hmm. believed a way that they voted differently from. It's just you pre pretending to know that which you do not know, and that is no different than a no. lie. You're, you're completely out of, I don't, I don't know where you get right. So from. your idea is the people who gave it's up, not an idea. listen, Roderick, it's the Roderick, just listen. Your argument is, okay. your argument uh -huh. is that the mm -hmm. people who had power and voluntarily right. gave up the power then 40 years later voted a black man in the president to and to be president those people were all the same group that were racially prejudiced this is your belief no, you're saying that what i'm saying is trying to separate prejudice discrimination you said white people felt that way some white yes. people felt that way the minority what i'm telling you is that the minority <laughs> what I'm telling you is that if I was studying racism, I would look at certain conditions that make the heinous acts possible. What so heinous acts? What heinous acts? What heinous acts? The public support for segregation, the what? public support for lynching. D dude, public... hold on, hold on, hold on. You're saying the public support for segregation, with, which millions of black people make today, that's... You've already become irrational. This is amazing. How, I'm giving how so everyone knows. the evidence that you are presenting is what mm -hmm. millions of black people today think. So your definition is calling them all racist. Is that what you're saying? And hey, what are you talking about? First off, you're conflating past and present. I'm trying to tell you 
that in order to understand racism, no, no, definitions don't change with time. Definitions don't change with time over that. If what you're saying was racist for white people to do in 1960, those same actions would be racist for somebody else today, correct? If they had the power. So I was trying to get- no, Who defines who has power? I don't understand. All right, I'm gonna have to back up. Who? First. All right. This, the, I, I don't understand what you're saying by power. You're, so for instance- Let me do it. I can't explain it. So, so are you saying that women have all the military industrial complex power right now? I don't know. I'll have to think. I don't they're, know. they're heads of CEOs First of all the companies. Explain. Are you saying that black people are responsible mm -hmm. and have all the power in Baltimore or are you saying white people do? First time, I'm going to ask you, do you want me to explain what I'm saying? Or do you want to just ask me to respond to you? Because I can explain. It's actually a very common understanding that no one, I think, who actually studies the issue doubts. What issue? If racism in everyday life to talk about treating people differently. Fine. Who's going to disagree with that? I, I don't I'm, understand what you're saying when you say who has power, though. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> and right. maybe get to the point. <laughs> so... <laughs> I mean, I mean, racism you're... in everyday life <laughs> to say, OK, a person is treating someone differently. I think that is fine. Go ahead. I know what you're saying and no one's going to disagree. What I'm telling you, though, is, is if you want to analyze these things carefully, you realize that there's a big difference. Right. So I'm not analyzing it carefully. Between individual actions of prejudice and discrimination mm -hmm. and these historical instances where you have the same ethnic or racial group dominating society, and they then, as a group, start to pass right. laws. Okay, what society and what group are you talking Examples about? Examples include Germany, right. Rwanda, the United States, and South Africa. These are so obvious. Why, why are you avoiding? I need to understand why you are avoiding. I'm not avoiding. You'd have to understand. Why are you first. avoiding all the area where black and brown people are in charge and actually did the original action? You, you're getting mad at the person that bought the burger versus the person that made the burger. No, what you're talking about, individual action. I, I don't know what you mean. The group, those countries, legalized slavery and legalized selling them off, but yet you dismiss their accountability? No. I'm not even talking about that. You're yeah, so about let's that. trace why white people. But do you understand black, my hold point? On. <laughs> let's just. Do you understand that racism in 1960 Matt, was very different than me as an individual mistreating you now in 2010 or 2021? No, I mean, because this is what I said you would do. You would choose a selective time frame and then act like that it applies to the past and the future when it doesn't. It always applies. Not Any true. Group, any group in power that sees themselves as racially or ethnically different has in the past imposed unfair laws on a minority group. That is what I want to study as a sociologist. Now, in everyday life, if you want to say that, okay. Why, okay, why are you ignoring all the data, though, in Nigeria? Why are you ignoring all the data in the West Coast of Africa? Why? What am I ignoring? You're ignoring that that's how all the slavery and all the heinous acts began. Okay, fine. What does it have to do with talking about the power? There was no difference? concept of race until black people in Africa sold black people to America. The concept didn't exist before then. So, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not quite sure. It's almost like you have this kind of uh, way of understanding that allows you to dismiss some things, and you just keep bringing it up. Like what? Like, what am I dismissing? About Nigeria. I, I'm not sure what that's going to help me here understand what's because, going on. Because you're talking about people with an ethnic belief who believe they are in <laughs> charge, and that's exactly what occurs in, in all these other brown and black-led countries. Okay. If, if you want to say that the Igbo in Nigeria control everything and are being, you know, I guess we'd say ethnocentric or I don't know. Of course they, they are. Against the group, then fine. I think what's happening here is as a white person, you take offense to this idea that in the United States, black people are not often called, called racist. And so this is what you're actually arguing. What, what am I arguing? That what? It must be because you keep trying to find. No, what is it? What is it that I'm arguing? Well, it seems like you don't want to concede that power differences matter in determining the impact of some kind of 
racial decision. No, race isn't real, dude. It's, it's just not saying, real. What about the Nigerians here? Okay, define, right? define black. All right, Roderick, go ahead and define black for me. What does that have to do with it? Because you're saying it's a race, right? What race are you talking about? Give me a race. I don't need to do that. I really don't. If, if, if a white person thinks that I am... So who is a white person? Is Sean King white? And treats me is, differently. Is Sean King white? <laughs> is Sean King white? It's not, it's not a trick question. Is he white? Uh, actually, I, I, I don't know. I've, I've heard of Sean King. Um, he's some kind of controversial figure. I don't know. So maybe you need to pick someone else. Well, go ahead and look on your computer. Pull up a picture of Sean King and tell me if he's white. What's that gonna matter? Because you're classifying people as an authority figure with power that you lack. You do not have the authority to group these people and label them black or white. You do not have the authority to call my friend black or white. From. If you don't want to classify them, you don't have to. But I can tell you that when a black person walks out on the street, they're not saying. So, so when Sean King's walks out onto the street, so, so when Sean King walks out onto the street, he is feeling he is feeling that he is being oppressed because of his blackness. I don't know what Sean King is thinking. No, listen. If you can't apply it, then what you're saying is just nonsense. You have to be able to apply this. I think so, you're saying something nonsense. No, no, no. Are you trying to tell me that when I walk out of this uh, 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 house here? People will just randomly assume that maybe I'm um, black, maybe I'm Japanese, maybe I'm uh, white. This is no, this is crazy. No, wh like, what I'm telling you is the most racist thing I ever heard in my life came from someone that looked like you. Oh, that's that's fine. People are different at the individual level, but I'm talking about. Right, but you're it. saying he can't be racist because he didn't have power. That's absolutely that's absolutely true. So if if look at it this way, maybe, and then I'll see if you let me get through this. We'll see. If you uh, go to get a job somewhere, right? And uh, you're living in a society where most people look like you. All right. If you happen to walk into a business where someone doesn't look like you, let's say they're, they're Arabic and they hate white people. Okay, that's bad. That's discrimination. Okay. If you flip it around and that Arabic person is in a society with all white folks and the majority of those white folks think that there's something wrong with those Arabic people, He's going to have a hard time getting a job. It's the difference between a minor inconvenience you might have and unemployment that the, that the uh, right. Arabic person right. Rod Roderick, are you aware? And that's what happened to black people up until recently. Okay, so are you aware <laughs> that I was an employee mm -hmm. in a mostly black agency mm -hmm. in a black city with all black leaders all the way up my chain of command? Um, I think I've heard you say. So something. was I? Was I? Was I a minority in a uh, power in in a, in a place that's held with power from blacks? My entire life has been has been serving under blacks with power. I, don't, I have no idea what you're saying. I think that's wonderful. If you don't have any idea of what I'm saying, I think that's uh, a little bit scary, because you would be the kind of person. No, no, you're, it doesn't map to reality, Roderick. Well, it absolutely does. Right. So by your standard, so how you I was under a racist evidence, situation. They come to this. Do you think I was you more like Roderick, 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 was I more likely uh -huh. or less likely to become a narcot to be a good and effective narcotics officer being white or black? No idea. When you ask me these questions and, and I don't have any uh, reading on it, I'm always going to tell you I don't know. <laughs> sure. I, I'm only going to talk about what so, I, I I think I have a strong right. So do you think in Baltimore, do you think it would be mm -hmm. easier for me to pretend to be a drug dealer if I were black or white? Now, I can imagine that it would be easier for you to pretend to be a blood drug dealer if you were black. But I don't know. I really have no idea. Right. So do you understand why narcotics detectives would be more likely to be black than white? Because more um, people who are selling narcotics in those neighborhoods are black. Right. So then was it was it was I climbing an uphill racist struggle with power by your definition to make it to the <laughs> narcotics unit? No, man, I see what you're doing here. I see what you're doing here. I, I've had this kind of thing before. It's the difference between a a macro level explanation and an individual level explanation. I'm talking about so an that, entire city, bro. No. As an individual, I can say that I'm I have talking had about an entire city. Uh -huh. The same okay. is true in New York City, in L.A., in Chicago. 
Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I don't, I don't quite understand. If I look at data, right, which you which you love a lot, it will tell me consistently that people see race. It will tell me consistently that there's discrimination against black people, that people are slightly, but not as much as before. No, no it doesn't. It tells you that black people are 16 times less likely to be killed by police. Amazing discrimination there. I, I think that it's wonderful that in this specific domain. Uh, you said everywhere. I just gave you a very critical you example. You gave where you're me wrong. everywhere for that domain. If, what if I'm looking at uh, loans? What if I'm looking at uh, rentals? What if I'm looking at these things at a national level? Forget it. I don't, I don't have any idea what you're telling me. Like I was following you when it came to these specific uh, uh, examples. First, because you would know more than me. And second, okay, I get it. In certain areas, you might see that, okay, this general pattern doesn't apply. But across American society, no. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're constantly seeing, we're rarely seeing uh, evidence of discrimination against whites. I think it's there. It's just that people aren't studying it. It's nonsense. There's tons of, there's tons of examples. I just gave you one, drug overdoses and suicides. Military. That's right. You did give me that. You did give me that. But every time we try and look at racial differences in terms of, for black people. Racial so differences the, provide no value. This is the problem. It's not uh, real. It, it might. I mean, it's not you real. Are being discriminated against? You can pass policy. You, you understand? There's no. There's no. It's a social construct, right? Are, are we? Do we have to have that discussion? I know that race is a made-up thing, but it matters when it's when people believe. It. No, it, it matters because you keep going about it. So something like suicide. Do you know that when you, the more you talk about suicide and promote suicide awareness, the more suicide goes up. Do you know that the more you talk about mass killings, mass killings go up. The more you tell your children that there's a racist monster under the bed, the more they continue to believe it. And I think you're a victim of that. Okay, well, that's fine. Um, I, I don't have kids, but I will certainly tell them that- There's nothing I, you can't do in this country, nothing. Wonderful, I agree with that. <laughs> right, so there's but nobody holding you down. There's nobody holding you down. being a black person, Again? No, nothing's holding you down. Nothing. Great. You don't have to give me the conservative bullet points. I know that. I, I'm not a conservative, so it'd be really, it's really that. rude to do that. So wait a minute. You just told me how I should think about me, mm -hmm. and then I tell you something, and I'm, I'm the rude person. How did I tell you you should think about you? Uh, there's nothing you can do. You, oh, you sound like you're patting me on the head. There's nothing you should do. These are you, things you're projecting. These are your these are your thoughts. They're not my thoughts. You are projecting. <laughs> not projecting anything. What I'm trying to tell you is that I agree with you that yes, a person should go out and strive to be the best that they can be, but don't be stupid. That your race does matter in the United States. There's too much data to to point that out. But still go out and do yours. That to me is the most But, but how does it matter? What are, what are what have white people stopped you from doing? Me in particular. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know this though, and if you want to kind of get deep into it, I've thought a lot about, at a, again, at a broad level, the difference in wealth accumulation. And so I grew up in a very poor home, and that was because of uh, past racism, and that my mother was not able, she went to a segregated high school, and the- No, 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 what, what were you not able to do? <laughs> you have to let me explain. These you you can't go man. back to the past. Don't go back to the past. What can you not do? You gotta let me explain. If you don't let me explain, you're not Dude, gonna- Dude, I'm, I'm simply not interested in, in that type of answer where you're gonna harken back to something- You asked no me an longer, answer. But it no longer exists, I'm not interested. What is stopping you today? Bro, what I'm are trying- white people today? Now listen, Roderick, today- I am trying to explain. You but you're not, you're not trying to explain it. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So any, my, my mother, and then this is one of the problems with this racial discussion because people are so like, so concerned about black people, you know, for, for whatever reason, they want black people to, to, to not have this right to say that they're, that they have racism against them. I don't know what- You have the right to say whatever the fuck you want. I just don't have to believe it or think it's not, or think it's, it's coherent. You don't even want me to explain what's going on now. I'm listening. Have... Okay, I'm gonna try and explain this. All right. That was a mass problem in the 60s. This, this lack of, of skill accumulation, all right? So, all right, I was born in 1975. So what that meant was my mother had very little to pass on to me, very little skills, very little money. I am impacted by this today in that I am 
a part of a cohort that had to disproportionately, at a group level, take out more loans, where we had no money from our parents to help us put a down payment on the house. So it means that uh, I'm very lucky, uh, you know, I agree with you that you can do anything you want. So it means that I was able to get a PhD and buy a home, but I'm paying a lot for this. I had nothing to put into it. I started from scratch. Now, at a group level, you find that black people experience this far more than whites. And that's because of being black. How? What, 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 what being born black, how did that, I, I I'm not understanding the connection. All right, well, if you don't get it, I don't know, man. I don't know, man. No, no, but I mean, when, when right now, <laughs> so somebody who was alive during that time, when your parents mm -hmm. were, right? So uh, oh, Denzel Washington is, uh, mm -hmm. no, not, not Denzel Washington, uh, Samuel Jackson is the highest paid actor ever. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Right, so he managed to have all the success. So is, was it being black? Was it, I mean, you understand that during that time frame, there, like, like in Tulsa, there was entire neighborhoods of, of black success. There was, there was black mm -hmm. people highly successful uh, right, right before everything was, uh, right before segregation ended, fatherless mm -hmm. homes were very low. Black unemployment was extremely low. You could get a house. I mean, you're, you, you can selectively pick a time frame, sure, but these things aren't consistent and indicative of black people. Black people have risen through power and have gotten success throughout mm -hmm. their entire existence, whether they came here as slaves or they were the one profiting from selling slaves. As white attitudes changed and morals changed, it allowed black people to then compete at the same level as whites. That is absolutely true. And it's now, I'm, I'm, I'm a part of the first generation where we've had somewhat of a level playing field currently. But we've also been in schools that have been worse uh, than others. On average, of course, you like to give the individual example. That's not so white I, people's fault, dude. You can't blame absolutely. white people for everything that black people do. In a place like Baltimore, black people are in charge of absolutely everything. None of that shit's white people's fault. The worst schools in this whole nation are not white people's fault. They're black people's fault. Come on. So you're, you're, you're an apologist. That, that's all How? it is. White people that voted for those policies. It was white people that put... I'm sorry, man. I mean, it, these things don't happen at random. What, what I mean, doesn't? Black people in segregated neighborhoods, it just happened. Or, or, or black people... You black know, people were more successful under segregation than after it. Say again? Black people were more successful under segregation than after it. That's why there's a return to things like black banks and buy, buy black that you see all over the place. Come on, man. I'm, I'm not, really I'm not, like I'm not ignorant here. to history. You're talking to the wrong one. Uh, I hope I'm not talking to the wrong one. <laughs> I don't know. Because I certainly believe that black people are better off now than they were in 1960. It's yeah, nice because that, everyone is. Uh, I think disproportionately white black people are better off. There was more black wealth in, 19, in, in 1960 than there is now. It was certainly the case. I, I've heard that black people had more wealth. They even had more farms. Yep. Right, this time. More land. But, but yep. Clearly, clearly uh, when it comes to rights, when it comes to visibility, when it comes to employment and high income positions, no. I mean, the, the gap between, even when it comes to educational attainment, the gap between white and black is <clears> Right. In America. It narrowed because people saw race and tried to do something about it. And right. But you, you're ignoring the whole rest of the is world. Ignoring race. But it, listen, listen to me. So do you think, do you think having a racist society and having 400,000 slaves gave the Americans some kind of superiority? I think what it did was that it helped the American economy. Right. Yes. So why didn't 4.5 million slaves in Brazil make them more powerful than us? I don't know anything about Brazil. I cannot say. Brazil had 4.5 million slaves. You can look up mm -hmm. the trade, slave trade. I think you should know this shit if you're going to have these narratives. But you can look up mm -hmm. the slave trade and how many people were sold. Why is it that the people that sold the slaves didn't have any kind of power? The people who had vastly more slaves didn't have this power. You group them with you. You group Brazilians as this oppressed group of people of color that, are the, or, that took mm -hmm. four and a half million of you. Four and mm -hmm. a half a million. I have no idea. What do you want to, what's the conclusion? It doesn't make any sense. How come everything is selective in your narrow perspective, but in the rest of the world, these no. things don't pan out? I'm not sure how looking at within having country, slaves country is, is not narrow. correlated to being productive and having things it's different histories, different, different legislation, different governments. Who had more I mean, money, the North or the South? 
Oh, I, I think that overall the North was wealthier. right. So the so the North went had a lot South more money. The North had a lot more money, a lot more success. No slaves sent their children to die to end the thing. And you think also, they owe you something? I didn't say that. Of course you do. <laughs> Sometimes you you reveal things that are that that are coming out in a long conversation. Uh, no, I didn't say that they owe me anything. I, I just think that America is racist and, and sometimes I think Okay, that so if they don't owe you anything, why should any white people give a fuck what you think? Uh, they don't have to. <laughs> I'm so, just so you just want to go around calling white people racist, that the country's racist, and, I don't and, call and white people, this is going to improve white things how? How is this going to improve I don't things? call... Yes, we, it, it certainly matters. And this kind of gets to this idea of race-based preferences. I believe that we see race. So you want to stop talking about race. I get it. There's a lot of people out there. They, they always talk about this book, Race Craft. It's a book that everyone wants to read or tell me that I should read. So fine. That's a, that's a perspective, actually. If that's uh, your perspective, that's cool. My perspective is that we need to recognize these racial disparities and, and attempt to do something about them. Name and one and one possible attempt. Can you make me under, help me understand that? Like, what would one be and a possible way to change it? Okay, well, I don't have anything in my head, but let's say I'm at, as a as a as a professor here. Suppose I see that black graduation rates are lower than other groups, and we can do this with any race. Actually, it could be like I think in Ohio State. Yeah. So why did you just why did you just group them into being black? Because they would identify as black, and other people see them as black. So Sean King's black in this situation. So if Sean King goes to Harvard, he can check black, and it's cool. Here you go with these individuals like, I don't know anything about you. You have to, not- well, you have to do this, dude. If the thing is, is if you have a thing that's societal, saying a thing is a societal truth, one thing that right. blows that out of the water ruins your entire hypothesis. You get that. Come on, no. man. No, 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 no. It's different levels of analysis. So how would <laughs> I distinguish? Officer, how would I distinguish? Listen, one- listen. If how would I distinguish? Officer, you one drug dealer how would is, I- is an angel. Do no. you expect all drug dealers? No, people, there's variations along the no, way. No, drug dealer is something that you do. You're classifying people by immutable characteristics, and you won't define what those immutable characteristics are. They're just your fucking opinion. That's fine. You ask a, a, another black person, do they see themselves as black? If you think it's my I, I, So I am asking you. Do, I'm going oh, to, I see myself as black, yes. I'm, okay, I'm, so I'm, you I'm, see I'm, yourself as black. So you've classified yourself into this racial division, yes or no? For sure, I'm, I'm a black American. Right, it, so it, you have taken yourself as a human being, and you have classified mm-hmm. yourself as a racial group, and then yeah. think things are occurring differently for you, and you don't think you're racist. One, a lot of problems that people have is they fuse for whatever reason, and this could go to this idea of whiteness and, and how white people think about race as opposed to black people. Just because- yeah, Again, didn't... why are you grouping all white people as thinking the same thing about race? That's fucking nonsense, and you need to stop. I You're feel like you have a, a hard time letting You're literally me a racist when you this say that. Really you understand tough, that, right? I think that you need to let me communicate what no, I You're not gonna sit there and call me a racist. Respond You're not gonna carefully. sit there and call me racist. I wasn't even talking about you. You are too. You're saying you think I'm white. I said I do. I, I, I perceive you as white. Okay. But so if, then you just said all white people do that. Fine. You're talking about me if you say that. You think you're white? No. Then exempt yourself. I check from- myself as human. No, I don't get to do that. That's the problem with you classifying. I don't get to do it either. That's the problem. People but you see are. <laughs> you just did it. You just said I'm if white. If you don't think you're white, then you don't have to worry about what I'm saying. Of course I do, because you're trying to change me. Identify as white. No, right. you don't want to do it. Fine. So listen, when Sean King goes and he checks black, and you say, oh, and he fails school, and you say it's a black problem, you're pointing to a white person and saying it's a black problem by your worldview. No, and I think what's happening here is you actually do identify as a white person, and you see this as accusatory. <laughs> You're going to double back and say, I don't see myself as a white person. Let's stop talking about race. If you see yourself as a white person, this is just simply a normal thing about people that are not like you. That's how you can think about it. But, but people see- are not like me in a whole bunch of different ways. And race isn't one of them because race isn't real. I agree with you. I, that's what I was trying to get at. Yeah, but you're classifying things that people that aren't real. That's why you can't name who is black and who is white. Because- what I was trying to tell you is that as a black American, this is not about my skin color. It is about my ancestry and the things that my ancestors. Nobody knows your ancestry or gives a fuck. You don't have to, but I do. 
But it's not about that. The way I treat you cannot be about something that I don't give a fuck about. But I do. It's like you're that trying to... That doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Ah, you're this talking gets about my actions. My this actions. is something I have noticed. If you don't want to see me as black, I think that's a little bit of a problem. But hey. Yeah, you're if, right. If I don't want to see, see you. I don't want to classify you as a race and treat you differently. That's a bit of a problem. Because it's not a race. You're it's literally a getting mad at me. You're saying that you are the same part of the same culture. Again, we had this discussion earlier. You know mm -hmm. nothing about black Baltimore culture. Nothing. Nothing. Well, and I identify Your blackness gives you no American. information at all. I actually enjoy this conversation. But you got to chill, man. You got to let me narrate my own ideas. <laughs> I mean, you can't keep like, boom, boom, boom. What I'm trying to tell you is that I identify as a black American. You can think what you want. I identify as a black American because I root myself in my, my forefathers being slaves in South Carolina and I trace my line through that. That's my own personal pride. If another person in Baltimore says, okay, fine, I'm not black at all. I'm just Baltimorean or whatever, I, I don't know what you call it. That's their choice, okay? I mean, really, but I'm telling you, if you ask a black person, okay, how, how do you identify? They're probably gonna tell you that they're black. So, I mean, I, I don't have a problem with this whole race craft uh, not seeing race. I think that's fine. But there's culture out there, man. And I'm, I'm proud to be a part of Black American culture. I, that, 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 I just explained to you how that makes no sense, and yet you went right back to it. Because that's my opinion. So if you... Right, but you understand that culture, you can't find fine. another Black person, one other one, that would define Black culture the same way you will. Okay, what does that mean? How many Because you're grouping everybody as the, the same, same thing that are clearly not coherent groups. Okay. There you can't are be a part of something that everyone else would agree you're actually not Baltimore, a part of. Maryland, American, how many Westerner, all those groups, man, all those groups, man, people are going to disagree on how to define them. So maybe you shouldn't classify people by them. Oh, shot. You don't want to. But the data, first off, if I feel that way, I'm cool. There's no, the there's no data about race, bro. There isn't. There's some, that's pretty clear, actually. So, so I, you, you had asked me about uh, race-based purposes and about graduating uh, college and stuff. We do find uh, that uh, there are racial differences in graduation. Asians are doing quite well, and whatever that is, we want to find out. Whenever you eliminate the racial thing, which is how they classify themselves, mm -hmm. once you eliminate that, you don't find anything. There's the, the reason's always something else. You can't just go well, to I, race I think because somebody else. said right. that. Somebody wrote it down. It is something else. The reason why people are doing differently in school has to do with their, their background. But the thing is, the race is an indicator of that. No, it's not. Do you think that a white kid raised by you, what, what can they not do? You have to look at group, uh, group You level, do not have to look at group things. You should stop saying that. It's a cheesy cop-out. It's not a cheesy cop-out. You do it in your own how can you study the patterns of something if you're just looking at individual cases? Because I study actions. You're studying labels, patterns. and the only person that gives this label pattern. is you. It's just that. I don't know what has happened, but that you, you, you have this idea that somehow, okay, race doesn't matter, so therefore everything anyone says No, is listen, if race matters, then you're saying something. You're saying that black people are born without what? What are white people better than black people at? Please tell me. And then you go with these weird questions again. You just no. said that Asians were better at school. So why are Asians better at school? Ah, and so that gets to the indicator thing. They're better because of how they came in as immigrants. Right. Right? Are Asians they, better at school? You just lied. Culture? I just need you to know that. They're not Say better it. at school. Okay. They're not. Now, Asians as a group I, are I not know, Asians. Uh, that goes against a lot of what I know. I, I know it does. That's Aggregated. the thing about this when you don't research stuff, Rod. The thing, Asians as a group clear do that, not uh, perform better. Asians are doing Only the top does. And why does the top perform better with immigrants? The top performs better with immigrants because they're the only people who can afford. You're literally getting the elites of other countries that come over here. They have to get over the ocean. They have to go through all the tests. They have to get through the system. It's very expensive to do that. Yes, that is absolutely correct. It's Koreans. Has nothing to do with race. You understand that? Nothing. 
I know that. So why are you classifying them as the race? The reason, no, the reason why I grew up in a low income <coughs> society is not because there is an essential low wealth inside of me. It's because of the actions that people had against people that they coded as black. So every, everyone who's talking about this. But that's not true because, no again, race. again, in that time frame, there were tons of black millionaires. You were, um, born, if you were no, born, man. what are you talking know, how many about? black millionaires you think there were? In the this 60s? There was like hundreds. Was there, there, was, there was estimated 100 millionaires just in Tulsa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then white people came and burned it down. Look, man, I... I right, I, so uh, you were poor because you were born to your lineage, just like me. But it wasn't because I, I you were going to say I'm white, and it's not because you're going to say you're black. It's because of the actions of a small pathway. You, if you were born in Tulsa to one of those millionaires, you would have been mm -hmm. different. And it would have, obviously, it's nothing to do with being black, dude. It's okay. clear. All right, if you say so, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> But I don't no, understand. I, How come? I, I so, so if you was, were born by the people that sold the slaves, would you have been in a better situation? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm done with this. I, I think that uh, I'm okay with disagreement. <laughs> and these things but, tend what's to. What's the disagreement, Rod? Can you tell me what the disagreement so, is? The disagreement is, is that you think it's okay to classify people by race and treat them differently. Is that our disagreement? I think it's okay to study the impacts of race. And I think it's okay if a person wants to identify with a certain race. Yes, absolutely. So what the major impact with, with making a social construct continue to exist is that as long as you will have that construct, you will always have discrimination based upon that construct. The same thing with genders, the same thing with any other social construct. And the only reason a social construct exists is because human beings continue to proliferate it. You are extending racism. I am not. Okay. If you say so. <laughs> I just laid out the path. Explain how that's not so. I think if you want to ignore the disparities and think that they'll go away magically, fine. I don't want to do that. So it's, it, it becomes a political thing. I mean, uh, it's, it's the same thing as between Democrats and Republicans never agree. You know, you want to take a race blind approach, which is fine. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I gave you plenty of examples of disproportionate mm -hmm. outcomes based upon that classification. That doesn't mean you have to proliferate the classification. It's literally, you're literally continuing to create it. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, if you say so. Right, so if the problem is racism, how does uh -huh. continuing to practice racism fight the problem? Well, since you want to define it as racism, we kind of get back to the beginning. I think that you can discriminate in order to uh, deal with racial disparities. The same way my school discriminates for better. So you want people. racism to stop racism. Fucking uh -huh. great, you gonna Roderick. Say Jesus fucking Christ, you're right, I'm done. I'm not talking to a racist, peace. <laughs>